All right, Sam. So you've had enough nice things to say. Look, this is where things stop being nice and they start getting real in the way that you're about to break down the areas of opportunity in Mauricio Pochettino's game. Yeah, time for the serious business. I think a lot of people have hit the nail on the head with, with the amount of concerns people have. And the first thing is obviously a lot more concerning that it should be because it overlaps with what we've already seen seen in the past two, two seasons. So the first thing I would say is a big issue is that Pochettino in his last couple of stints, which is PSG and, and Tottenham, he's got you know world-class attackers who've made his attack work. And if you look at Kane, Eriksen, Son, plus you know the original Dele Alli at Spurs, consistently able to outperform their metrics. It, it was just astounding to see how well they converted the, the chances that they got. The amount of times Kane and Son were smacking it from 20, 25 yards. Ericsson was hitting them from, from long range and getting that ball in. Dali Ali was like breaking his neck to get into positions and, and score. It looked a little like, you know, it, it isn't sustainable over long term. So it, it looked like it was just the quality of forwards that they had that created that level of damage. Obviously, when you went to, to PSG, you could see that, you know, Mbappe, Neymar, you had Di Maria and then Messi obviously came in. Those attackers are obviously, they're not going to need any kind of instruction or coaching. I don't think you can coach an attack like that. You just leave them to their devices and and, and the rest is like history. So I was just calculating the, the weightage that the top two, the most advanced forward players in Pochettino systems have had. And they've basically scored 44 to 60% of the team's goals. And who are our top, two or most advanced players, you know, and are they capable of breaching that level of numbers or that level of output? I'm not certain, Dan. I'm not certain. I think he will raise a little bit of, you know, the ceiling and try to get us firing again. But to say that the attack has been abysmal this season is a massive understatement. I think 15 teams have scored more than us. Even if we, you know, performed two hour XG, um, we would possibly be only two places higher in the table. So I think that's how bad it has been. So um, that is what well, troubles I mean, it was me about, a lot. It was and, about a, as effective as the most recent SpaceX launch attempt in terms of getting off the ground. <laughs> that was Chelsea's attack. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> no, actually, you know, then I was looking at the long range goals because I was, I, I just got this feeling that there were too many you know, thunderclaps from distance that were finding their range. And I just went back and saw, you know, the level of, or the quantity of long range goals that were, that were being scored. Um, in his first season, they had 11, which was second behind City. The next season, they had 10, um, then 11, then 14 in the following season. So they were always in the top two or top three in the Premier League. So they do have, you know, a tendency of, or had a tendency of having those attackers who would, go and shoot from range and score a lot. Um, I compared our numbers and we were significantly lower. <laughs> but uh, I think it just goes to show that when you have that level of attacking quality, you can afford to take you know, shots from distance. It's something that he used very frequently against lower blocks when he was playing with Spurs. Just the fact that you couldn't allow Ericsson, Son or Kane to have that level of space worked in their favor. So when people were asking about, there were a lot of questions about, okay, how does he deal with low blocks? You know, how does he, how does he perform? With Spurs, I think that level of threat of just getting your attackers in position, obviously as a positional coach, he wants certain things in terms of like four attackers or three attackers in the last line, fullbacks pretty wide, making sure that they're pinning the, the last line. And then the midfield line, you're stretching with a couple of midfielders, maybe three, so a two, three, five or a two, three, one, four. And then you would want somebody like an Ericsson or, or a Son or an Ali to, to take a long range shot. So you're forcing the defense to step out because you're making them uncertain. So it worked for Spurs. I think when they came up against those kind of defenses, it worked in their favor a little bit. But uh, at PSG, it was, it was less so. Even with the quality that they had, it just looked very, very static. It just looked like they were relying on transitions all the time. Like they were trying to, to make things happen. Uh, from breaks and then using Mbappe's speed and then off the ball movement and his dribbling. 
So it did look a little stale, but I think it's the world-class attackers who've, who've made the difference so far. And when he comes here, he's not going to find any of it unless, of course, we end up signing one or we end up converting one of the ones that we already have into one. No, definitely something to keep in mind as we think about uh, what recruitment may need to happen in order to just fill out and give any individual, not just Mauricio Pochettino, but any Chelsea manager was begging for someone to help add the goals this past season and wasn't getting that support. I think there's a couple other ones. And the next one you have goes into the reliance on the attack of being uh, heavily transition based. And so why don't you walk listeners mm -hmm. through what that actually means and, and why that might be an area of concern. So basically transitions is the moment between when the opposition team loses the ball and, and the first few seconds of when you have the ball. And it's been something that we've been doing with, with Graham Potter after, you know, the initial trying to to impose a certain style of play it didn't work then we tried to go very transition heavy as soon as the ball was won back we would try to get felix on the ball and then play balls in behind for somebody like a howard to run on to and it did work sometimes our quality of chances went up you know the numbers went better up until a certain moment of time but then again after that the level of finishing that was that was there howard was missing chances left right center felix was very very bad mudrik was missing chances it just didn't convert uh, into the kind of output that we expected. So at Spurs, he's, and even at PSG, I would say, he's been somebody who's relied a lot on using counters and using transitions. He waits for the ball to be won back close to his area or in the middle of the pitch. And then you try to hit one of the attackers. So when you play a 4-2-3-1 in, in Pochettino's image, one of the three attacking midfielders or even the center forward, Harry Kane would drop very deep and he would act as the first outlet out of pressure. So as soon as you won the ball, you hit the center forward who's very far away from the center backs, but he's also in the zone where the central midfielders, the opposing central midfielders aren't really paying a lot of attention to him. So he has the space to receive, turn and then pick three runners beyond him. And we've got powerful runners like Son, when you've got guys like Dele Alli running into the box, you know, into space behind center backs who don't have anybody to mark, then it becomes a problem. And obviously the speed that Son had, if you had enough space to play him into, you've seen the kind of balls that Harry Kane puts in behind the defense. The kind of, you know, through balls Ericsson and the kind of chances that he was creating. I think he, was, he created a hundred plus chances at one point. Um, so that level of creativity, that level of hitting space and then having somebody like a Harry Kane at the end of it, having somebody like a Hume Minson at the end of it, finishing those chances worked very, very well for him. The same goes for Mbappe. Uh, the amount of times PSG would, instead of being a positional team, you would want them to exert a level of assurance saying, I'm going to win the ball back. I'm going to get into structure and then I'm going to play it, you know, get my attackers into position and then I'm going to hurt you. Something that a Pep Guardiola used to do at one point in time. But Pep's also gone a little bit of the transition route. He's also very good at using you know, Kevin De Bruyne and then using Haaland running into space. That works very well for them. But I think Pochettino relies, like over relies on that a lot. There's also this tactic that he used very, very often was that using Hugo Lloris or, or one of the centre-backs to go very long to Harry Kane. And then Harry Kane would challenge for the duel, say somewhere around the just the beginning of the final third. And from there, um, you would push the attacking midfielders close to Kane. So you try to win the ball back there. And then you would explode into attack. So when the long ball, what the long ball does is you're bypassing your opponent's first wave of pressure. Sometimes that's about like, say, if, if they're pressing in a 4-4-2, you're bypassing somewhere around six players. You can also bypass sometimes like, you know, four or five. So you're effectively trying to get numer numerical superiority in the other team's half. And then you're trying to use quality to get into you know, the attacking third and try to finish off goals. So that's something that he relied on a lot. And, and Harry Kane was a complete forward. You know, he's somebody at his prime who could hold up the ball 
who could play it short, who could link up, who could even just, you know, he didn't even need a second person. He would just collect the ball, turn around and smack a through ball for somebody running through. So having that level of forward who could do all of that was also very, very interesting. So is that emulatable in a side that doesn't possess those characteristics? Or will he have to change tack and then go a little more positional, try to coach attackers to function a certain way? I think that's the question that I'm asking myself. I'm not saying Pochettino isn't capable of doing it. I'm saying that at Spurs and PSG, I did not see it. That is a, an interesting point. And again, we'll hopefully get to see uh, a fair bit of data points in the and not very near future because we're hoping that, uh, you know, and the reports seem to be that Frank Lampard will carry out the remainder of the season and that Pochettino will get the opportunity to take over responsibilities once the season has ended. Sam, as you think about the other areas of concern, where are you heading next? Um, I would say his game plans against high level opponents i think Ooh, uh, a point of criticism into... that people have had <laughs> about his record yeah. versus top six opposition and uh it's been pointed out and uh look we, we haven't had a good record of it recently um you know under our, our you know last that's three managers <laughs> so uh, um <laughs> you know I, I guess relatively speaking it uh, it is something that we would want to kind of make sure people are aware of in terms of how his teams have performed against the uh, upper echelon of the competitions he's been in. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, I wouldn't look at just the end result and say that's something that concerns me. It's how he's getting there. I think that's a little more worrisome. He shows a repeated trend of trying to be very reactive you know when he comes up against sides that he thinks are going to dominate possession are going to edge possession I wouldn't even say dominate you know, sides that just are a little better at keeping the ball he just goes deep he just sits in a mid block sometimes a deep block he waits for opponents to come and then he tries to hit you on the counter and if you do that at PSG with with the likes of Neymar and Messi and and Mbappe having to sit in a compact block and defend. It's its not going to help. You know, it's definitely not going to help. You might edge out results from time to time. I think PSG, when they were playing Manchester City, they won 2-0. But the man of the match was Donnarumma because the amount of times he bailed them out, I think he made seven or eight saves. And although the result looked very good for Pochettino, it, Manchester City on another day would have, you know, come out significantly on top. So I think it's just one of those results that shows... All was not well. Um, he consistently sets up like that, even against Dortmund. Like the, some of the, the goals that I saw for Harry Kane and, and so on, the same, the absolute same thing that I mentioned previously. It was just ball won back by one of the center backs or, or one of the defensive midfield pivots, long ball to Kane, long ball to Son, 1v1 or 2v1, and then Kane bursting through, shrugging off a defender and finishing, and Son doing the same. So, it's the same strategy. It's just how viable is it? And when you come up against a side that has figured you out, that you're probably going to try and do this, which may explain why, you know, they tailed off later on or why results went bad at PSG, where, you know, decent teams are sitting back and, and just saying, you know what, try and damage us in possession because you know that that's not something that you're very comfortable doing. That was their unraveling. I think his reactiveness is an issue. His setup against high level opponents is an issue he's he's not somebody who will go there with intent with proactiveness and say i'm going to show them that i can keep the ball and i can hurt you with the ball i think that's something that that also concerns me i'm yet to see him as a positional coach use possession to actually create openings or damage it his attacking patterns are a little hazy i'm trying to find these repeated level of patterns at psg i can't because Neymar and Mbappe don't really make the same run twice. They're, they're trying to do something else. They're trying to basically stay together and and play off intuition. It's the same with Kane and so on. You know, you would see them make the same kind of runs, but you wouldn't see the same thing repeated twice. It would just be 
small interchanges, one, two, and then long sprints behind the behind the back line. So I think that's something that okay comes good once, twice against high level opponents, but how many times is it going to happen? And and why aren't other facets of attacking play visible then? I think those are questions that again, when I'm looking at his Spurs side, when I'm looking at his PSG side, sort of keep me up at night. Well, hopefully it's not giving you uh, nightmares. And uh, there's uh, other things that you can focus on in terms of thinking about how Pochettino and his side will coalesce at Chelsea. And I think that brings us to the last one, which is a little bit more of a issue at PSG and less so at Tottenham, but the inability to get PSG to look like a team rather than a collection of talented individuals is one of the last points that we want to talk about when it comes to just where where the issues are from a concern standpoint. Yeah, I think there is a certain dichotomy when I look at his body of work. I was talking to Ali, Ali Radhi, who's um, a really, really intelligent PSG writer, fan analyst. You know, please go check him out on, on Twitter somebody who does a lot of tactical breakdowns and as somebody whose work I looked at when we were looking at Thomas Tuchel. So he's extremely, you know, well-versed with what is going at PSG. So he told me that, you know, there was, there were an incredible amount of concerns. It just looked like the team had regressed as a whole under Pochettino. Um, there were concerns about how the team was organized. The team looked very vulnerable to counters, especially, you know, uh, in the space behind the wingers because your your fullbacks are pushed you know very high up there would also be susceptibility to to counterattacks on the wings and you don't expect guys like Marco Verratti and and um any of those central midfielders Idrissa Gay can do a good job but Marco Verratti coming out on the flanks to defend as a central defensive midfielder you wouldn't want that happening and and that's something that consistently happened he talked about how, you know, fullbacks, like somebody like a Nino Mendes, not really something that he elevated. It's not, there's not been a sizable improvement for any players. But then again, you look at PSG's quality individual-wise. I'm like, how much can he improve, say, an Ashraf Hakimi? Or how much can he improve Mbappe, Messi, Neymar, Di Maria, or Draxler, for example, uh, at this stage of his career? So I think when I look at that, and when I look at, Tottenham where he did most of his work I, I still feel like you know how much of it is still applicable because I looked at some of the games <clears throat> from say 15, 16, 16, 17 um, there was a notable difference in the level of opponents uh, I, and I say this with all due respect you know Tottenham weren't getting pressed very high by, by opponents um, there wasn't the level of brilliance you see from say somebody like a Roberto De Zerbi you see from all the coaches now, say Nunai Emery, for example, the level of organization, the level of pressing, even the level of playing out. So the way Spurs were pressing, they were very good because back then sides weren't as good as playing out from the back. You know, the level of centre-backs, technically proficient centre-backs back then, weren't the same as the ones that the Premier League has right now. So can those positional pressing principles work five years, six years, seven years later? is, you know, a, a big gap. I think it's the same reason Luis Enrique got rejected because it had been a long, long time since he's managed uh, a club side. And I look at Pochettino where he's got one year of experience and then his last was in 18-19. It's a long time for the Premier League to improve. So has he been outdated? Has Have his methods been left behind? Um, what has he done in, in those three, four years to bring him up to speed with what's happening in terms of tactical development, in terms of the new things that we are seeing from build up or, or how to counteract them. We haven't been able to put an image to that. We haven't been able to find a discernible proof or evidence that he's he's kept up with it. And the only way we find out is when he takes charge of the side. So right now it's like in limbo. And I'm, I'm thinking his first side were good back then, you know, and and they were good at they were very, very good at certain things back then. But how does that translate to now when, when sides are more conscious, when when there is a higher level of players available to even say a top 10, top 11 side? They have some really, really good individuals who can play out the back, play out of a press, line breaking passes. 
you know how well can can we press against those guys and ex- um, you know expect the same level of success so um that's just the cynic in me asking those questions he might well be well well ahead of if everything that i've mentioned but it's just a question that i would say is is a cautious you know question we should be asking um before he takes charge of his first game all right, Chelsea fans, want to give you a shout out to Indeed.com. That's right. When you are drafting your fantasy team, do you ever wish you could handpick the best stars for your business team? If you're building your talent roster, you need Indeed. Look, with Indeed matching as soon as you sponsor a post, you will get a short list of quality candidates whose resumes match exactly what you're looking for on Indeed. Boom, it's hiring at warp speed. So what do you got to do? You got to visit Indeed.com forward slash blue wire to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash blue wire link in the description below terms and conditions obviously apply cost per application pricing not available for everyone need to hire you need indeed so as we think about and move forward to this idea it's now august it is the near the start of the Premier league season it's the first press conference ahead of match day one and He's talking about players in the lineup. He's talking about players he's excited to get their first minutes under their legs to start the season. And we're thinking about players who are potentially going to win or benefit the most from someone like Mauricio Pochettino coming into Chelsea. Uh, We got the question from uh, Gospod Professor and Danny Windsor 96 is asking who who are going to benefit and Sam, I, I put it in here, I gave you the script, and I'm basically the only thing I had filled out when you had touched it was which player was going to win. And it's Mason Mount. Mason Mount, Mason Mount, Mason Mount is likely one of the biggest winners if Mauricio Pochettino does get appointed. We heard it from Matt earlier. We've heard it independently from people who've maybe, you know, been – a couple of degrees separated from an understanding of where this is heading that Pochettino would want to keep Mesa Mount and would want the club to do what is necessary to keep him here beyond this season and beyond next season and into uh, the foreseeable future. Yeah, definitely. I think Mount is somebody who instantly stood out to me. It was uh, I think he's a player Pochettino would love to coach. Obviously, we've talked about the physical uh, fundamentals that he demands from his players, and Mason Mount is incredible in those respects. And I think something that even his detractors would not sort of um, argue against is his level of physical output. You know, they often use it to to sort of like insult him. They say, "Oh, he's a you know he's a pit bull and he's a terrier. He runs around everywhere." But he does run around and he's extremely dynamic. He's he's a very good presser. He's usually the trig, you know, the pressing trigger. He he offers that impetus for the rest of our side to go in and press and, and win the ball back. So he's somebody who will offer that in spades in a 4-2-3-1. You know, you put him either in, in the number 10 slot, where I think he will be very, very good, or you put him on the right hand side, either way. Because in a 4-2-3-1 with which Pochettino plays. Either of those guys are allowed to drop back, occupy the space between the between the defensive midfield and the attacking midfield, and pick up balls in space, help and build up, and then orchestrate play from deep. It's something Ericsson did very very well. I don't think Mason's technical quality in terms of his vision and execution is is quite as good as Ericsson, but Ericsson is, I think, the gold standard. We're looking at somebody who is you know right there up there with the likes of. Fabregas or the likes of all those technical playmakers that you can name. I think Mason's a couple of notches below that. But in terms of other qualities also, he just fits. You know, somebody who can run beyond the center forward into space, he showed that. You know, under Graham Porter, we saw him do that with Aubameyang. Uh, if you watch the AC Milan game back, he's done that consistently, even with Harvards. As soon as Harvards receives and turns his back, you know, Mason is making those runs in behind the center back to try and receive in space. So he's He's tactically attuned to that role and that responsibility as a as a free role as an AM. I think it's something that will definitely intrigue uh, Pochettino to no end. He's also somebody who's arguably one of our best long range shooters. Something we've missed desperately from from the front line. We haven't seen 
you know, accurate long range efforts. I don't know how many we scored from outside the box. I don't even remember the last one. I don't even remember the last time we scored. I think it's that bad a season. But um, yeah, it's just, I think he he does fulfill a lot of the criteria that Pochettino wants from his from his ideal AM. So I would say he is a is a big, big winner. Um, the second I would say is, I think it would be safe to say Nkunku is, is a very good option. Um, I've been watching him since his injury and unfortunately he he hasn't been as good. I think he's still struggling. He's still getting back up to speed. Um, he's also been on the bench a couple of times. So it does look like he will take some time to get back to speed. But um, the role that he played for at RB Leipzig, you know, very similar, using Silva as as the strike decoy and making runs beyond him, getting into the box, finishing, dropping deep, and then carrying the ball through lines and, and attracting pressure. I think he's excellent at it. If you put Nkunku even on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, or the center, he's going to be absolutely phenomenal there. So I think Pochettino would, would love... Um, somebody in the ilk, somebody in the technical quality that Nkunku has in tight spaces, his finishing quality absolutely must be, you know, raring to get him to play in the side. So I think that's somebody else who would would benefit a lot. Mudrik also is a very interesting um, option. You know, we've seen all those videos of him absolutely pumping iron in the gym. I think he's somebody who works very hard. We've seen the the level of acceleration, the speed that he possesses arguably one of the fastest in the Premier League. So he's already got those physical fundamentals, right? And I also, the, the games that I saw him play, you know, for um, Shakhtar, it just looks like he's, all he's lacking is confidence. He's just very rattled by not playing games. Obviously, he was frozen out for a couple of games. He just, he was nowhere near the starting lineup, didn't play any minutes, had a couple of bad performances, but consistently playing that role, getting a little rhythm into his body, you know, getting those first few take-ons right, getting those few mistakes out of his way, I think he can be very good. He's also shown that he's happy to drift centrally. He's able to dribble through lines in the half spaces. He's able to attack the box also if required. I think there there are some shades of Hyung Min Song there. You know, he's not going to obviously offer you headers and and offer the kind of box movement that Son offers as, as an auxiliary forward. But everything else in terms of long range shoot and, and sort of finishing and getting into the box and causing a lot of damage with his gravity, I think that's something that we definitely need to look at. And the fourth, at the risk of getting absolutely pelted with no, bananas. Do it, do it, do it. And apples and strawberries. <laughs> I, would say, I would say Romelu Lukaku, a lot of people what? ask me about a lot of people ask me about this. They're saying, you know, what do you think of, of Lukaku? And I think like Poch would would definitely enjoy working with Lukaku. He's he's built for his system. I think somebody who's obviously loved attacking space in front of him. What Tuchel did wrong was profiling him as a back to goal man, you know, somebody who will win you duels and then, you know, can compete for that first ball and then hold play up. That's not Lukaku at all. You know, that's that's not how Conte used him. His, his first touch is a trampoline. Everybody knows that. In a, in a, you know, a league like the Premier League where you're trying to get him to control under pressure, it's not going to work. But you ask him to, to chase a ball, you know, against one centre-back or, or a couple of defenders where he's had the liberty to, you know, use his strength and where his touches, where his touches don't really have that repercussion of, of, you know, coming off wrong. He can take the odd wrong touch because there's so much space ahead of him. I think that's where he thrives. And he's always thrived when Conte has given him that kind of space to run into. And it's something that Harry Kane has done. It's something that a lot of other forwards that he's used has done. So I think Lukaku will enjoy it. It's just Pochettino needs to go back watch inter games from the title winning season and just see how Lukaku was used, how Conte used Hakimi as like, you know, the fullback outlet. These are things that he needs to go back and say, you know, I need to implement this if I want to use Lukaku. And I think he's somebody with his level of finishing, with his level of output, with his speed, he can offer us something that we're missing at number nine that we wouldn't have to spend a hundred million again on. The big caveats, obviously, is that the fans are never going to accept it. And uh, 
The second part being that his fitness is a huge, huge concern. It just looks like he's got a major, major digestive issue that was diagnosed at Inter Milan. Uh, I don't know if it's a gluten allergy or if it's if if it's just something to do with his gut. Something went wrong, but um, he tends to put on weight very, very quickly in in certain circumstances. So if he can handle that, great. But there are just too many factors that could that could make you know make this go wrong and go south very, very quickly. But if I had to look at Lukaku in a very neutral way, which is my job to do on this pod, I would say he's somebody that Pochettino would actually like and enjoy playing with. I think he would absolutely love to play in, in a side like this. It just depends on, you know, how well he's accepted, how well he's received, and if he's willing to come back, zip his mouth, and do the hard work. Lots of questions that are going to need to be answered there. And I know that for the most part of this season, the injuries that he's run into have been in relation to a hamstring issue that kept him out pretty much through, looks like, uh, week match four through the 11th. And then uh, for in Syria, then he missed weeks 13 through 15 due to a biceps injury and then had one week off for a knee inflammation. But then basically since the start of the year, um, through you know middle of the, the year to now, uh, he has been playing uh, what it looks like mostly uh, 60s, 90s, 80s, and uh, been you know, able to get a few goals, but not maybe as much as you would hope for from uh, your, your, your striker as well, with you know some losses in there to... Juventus, uh, Fiorentina, Monza, and and a few others. So it uh, doesn't need necessarily seem to be like he's uh, lighting it up. And you know, Inter don't always like to spend money on players. So it, it does feel like there is not a whole lot of a market for Lukaku out there. And uh, you would have to figure out if he wants to try, wants to be a part of it. Feels like he can make his way back with the supporters. And uh, look, I mean, goals will score a lot, you know, fix a lot of problems. If you come back to Chelsea and you start scoring, uh, you know, every 110, 120 minutes, uh, you might become one of the most popular people in, uh, in SW6. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think three fourths, I mean, I'm being generous, um, about 80% of the fan base would happily ship him off to Timbuktu or like attach him to a rocket and like shoot him to Uranus. But like, I, I'm just genuinely saying that if you could use somebody you've already spending 30 million a year on and, you know, sit him down with Pochettino and say, look, I play in a system that affords you space, not behind, but in front of you. And you've got guys who are willing to sort of offer that level of support, give you the kind of opportunities that you enjoy. Why wouldn't you want to revitalize your career? Maybe next season we'll find a better number nine somebody who's not costing a hundred million despite, you know, having some red flags here and there, maybe then we can reconsider. But if you're looking at options right now, I would say it is worthwhile to test him. It is worthwhile to give it a shot. Oba was also somebody, if he was 30, 31, I would have definitely said explore that as well. You know, I think both those guys we've sort of not used properly. I'd, there was one criticism of Porter that I had, that the way it was Aubameyang was just frozen out. Um, you know, people will disagree with me and, and I respectfully say that's all right. You know, no problem at all. But um, first of all, just double subbing him. Uh, and then after that, just removing him from the Champions League squad. Despite him being a senior player, people say, oh, he's not done anything. But he was Champions League top scorer. When you look at his, his Premier League expected goals, it was 0.92 and he scored one goal. So he's actually not even underperformed. We've not given him the kind of service that he needs. So when I was looking at the playing style when Oba was playing, it wasn't conducive to him at all. We were very, very bad. We were just entering crisis mode. And if you could compare Oba's performances to anybody in this squad, Felix, anybody, you name it, they're as bad. You could have booted out anybody from the Champions League squad. So again, it just burnt bridges. And I just have to explore how bad is it? You know, how bad is it stung Oba? How bad is it stung Lukaku? You know, do they want to work with a new manager, with a squad that has completely changed? And if they're up for it, if they genuinely want to, try them out in preseason. You know, go for it. If not, 
then try and get a number nine and and you know do the need for and move them on but uh, i think it would be it would be pretty uh, unresourceful of us to not explore those possibilities first yeah i think that's the key point and again we're not trying to anger anybody by saying these things because there is a lot of emotion behind the feelings towards lukaku the timing of that interview underlined bolded italicized that leaves people feeling very very disappointed in the way that he chose to conduct himself in also the then it, certain issues that he ran into playing under you know in this Chelsea team under this Chelsea side and his desire to get back to Inter Milan to Serie A and to not see that kind of go off it would be beneficial to all parties if some type of building of the bridges back could happen if we were to go into a world in the future in 2024 and Lukaku has scored 20 goals and is Chelsea's top scorer and Chelsea are on our way to uh, a very easy top four finish and maybe very deep in some cup runs and getting ready to look towards a future in 2024 and 2025 going back into European competitions, everyone would be better for it because the reverse outcome is that you continue to lose multiple tens of millions on this player each season who uh, you have signed and is becoming um, a massive bust and is a liability on your your p l and yeah i think you outlined it perfectly sam is that there, there just has to be some and there has to be some thought without the emotion and mm -hmm. figuring out if there is something there and look you know uh, oh, Poch has been able to take some players and, and turn them around. And could this be someone, could it be a talisman for him? So could it be a magical type of relationship, particularly with the fact of, of his focus on player personnel and fitness in the way that he coaches his sides. It almost seems like that Conte level expectation of what he wants his players to do might be able to bring Lukaku around if that were the case. And again, I'm just playing a little bit of devil's advocate. I'm trying to build a case for it. I'm not advocating that that has to be the thing we do, but I'm also trying to think mm -hmm. about if you want to sign all these other really talented players and numbers of keys positions, you have to figure out how you find some ways to uh, adapt appropriately when necessary. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. And uh, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at somebody who's obviously made a big mistake, um, hasn't really apologized very well for it. But again, it's just, if we look at it bereft of any emotions, we've, we've gone through a very, very bad time since the team has struggled, everybody's struggled. So if, you know, people are saying no clean slates because they've lost patience, but you know, look where we are, we're genuinely mid table. And then we are not even creating the kind of opportunities that places anywhere near the top six, let, let alone like, you know, anywhere near top four or top two in a title challenge where we should be. So use everything that we have, you know, try to get everything, um, squeeze every last drop that you can. I think that's the strategy that, that we should apply, especially if, if the counterpoint is spending a hundred million on another Serie A striker who, you know, has some question marks. People are saying, Osman, is it? He is genuinely very, very good, but you know, he also has gains where he's had seven, eight passes. So he's got Mbappe level of, you know, sometimes he's, he's elusive all game, but he pops up with a goal. But how feasible is that in the Premier League? Those are questions that the recruitment setup has to ask and talk about with, with everybody else and say, is that worth 120 million? And if that happens, sure, go for it. But if not, you know, use what you have. You have Two genuinely world-class forwards. You have Aubameyang and Lukaku. And anybody who's not saying that they're world-class, you know, they are being biased. They've, they've shown a track record. Oba, this is his first bad season in a long, long time. I think it must have been before Dortmund. I think every other place that he's gone into, he's, he's returned, as has Lukaku. So even at Manchester United, where people called him like, you know, bulky, fat, whatever, 
he had weight issues which were undiagnosed he was still scoring goals at almost like a game every as a goal every two games so you know maybe there's something wrong with us we need to look at it and say okay let's fix it and i think that's the way to go about it yeah while well, we continue to look in the mirror and shift our focus a bit there's also the thought about which players maybe are not going to be the beneficiaries of Pochettino coming in. Uh, you put one on the list that I think is going to catch people off guard. I threw a late one in, which I also think might catch people off guard. So let's start with one that won't, and we'll continue to talk about forwards and maybe discuss why Kai Havertz might be one of those individuals. And then we'll go to the one that you put first on the list. Okay, so yeah, I think Havertz is, you know, at at breaking point in his Chelsea career. I do feel bad for him because um, he is he is trying his best. It it just looks like he's come to a point where uh, we were just mentioning this again before the pod. He's played more minutes than anybody else in the squad. You know, even more than the goalkeepers. And he's been somebody who's participated in the last two grueling campaigns and. We've seen the kind of effect it has had on other players. You know, Chilwell's broken down, James is broken down, Mount is broken down. Um, Howards is somebody who's had little injuries, but he still comes back to, you know, try and give it his best. I think he must be absolutely shattered physically. Um, and then a game where I think we saw him absolutely dip after 50 minutes. I was like, this guy's this guy's done. Like he has nothing in his gas. If the season ended today, he would be the happiest. But it looks like it's a it's a very sad situation. If there was somebody like a Nagelsmann who came in, offered an attack which was very close together and offered like interchangeable avenues, maybe I would be a little you know enthusiastic about it. But I don't know how he ends up in a in a Nagelsmann system. You know that ten position is very very crucial. And if he does play as the second striker again, like how capable is he of playing people in behind? He's obviously very good in that Delhi Alley sort of box crashing, late arriving kind of role, but it's just how well Pochettino can use him. I think there there can be a way, but I'm seeing the bigger picture. Like he's not returned in a long time. Um, I don't know how many years he has on his deal left, probably like another one, two years left. Is it worth extending him with the thought that he might require a little bit of a pay bump? He's already on astronomical wages. So is it just the right time to sell him if a good offer comes? So I think those factors combined sort of tell me that he might not be the one. But if there is one player I would say could surprise me in in Pochettino's system, it's either this guy or Felix, like one of the two. If Felix's loan is sort of renewed, like Lukaku, I think one of those two guys could end up surprising us. But that's just the optimist in me. Well, we appreciate your optimism. And so not to put you on the spot, but this one is going to maybe be a head scratcher for people. And I think I know why you've put his name on the list, but it's one of the players who has been shut down for the remainder of the season to recover and rest up. And it's not the one named Mason Mount because we already talked about him, but it is one Reese James. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I think I think there is there is there was sort of clear a clear indication that James was being played at center back for a reason. I think the fact that they were trying to conserve him, they were trying to make sure that he wouldn't be run into the ground, um, played a big factor in in Porter actually putting him at right center back. I think he did it with keeping Reese James's long term future in mind something a lot of people won't appreciate, but I think that was 100% the intention because there's no other reason why you would put a fullback that scored that level of goals and provided that level of assists and was arguably the best right back in the world. Do you hold him back and put him in a centre-back position? There's no other reason or explanation why. So we saw it. The moment you put him in a right-back position, he's gone and, and done a hamstring and now he's going to be out for the rest of the season. Now, Pochettino relies a lot on his fullbacks. He's going to require them to run up and down, and, and it's going to be very intensive. The fitness is going to be crazy. Um, the level of burst, the level of sprints are going to be crazy. And I think James might suffer because of it. People might say that, oh, it might end up actually making him stronger, but the, the amount of issues, recurring issues that he's having with his ankle, with you know um, other parts of his body, I think hamstring, he's done his first time. Uh, but 
the ankle has been a been a persistent issue and i don't think that's a conditioning slash fitness problem so if that's going to be the case if that's the amount of workload you're going to put him under then i think he might end up suffering again under pochettino and pochettino is not somebody who's going to you know rotate a lot he relies on a core set of players and he will make sure that he plays them very very well he might have to adapt to reach james to to change it up but um, if he decides to play him week in week out like all top players want to do it could be very detrimental to his development i think i fear that he might end up getting more injured because of just the level of exertion that will be that will be put upon him now maybe i'll ask you a question about yours because i'm sure you'll have a question about mine what about the introduction of gusto to the side next season in terms of offering a rotation for James, but then also offering less games over the totality of the season due, due to the lack of competition, competitions not being in the Champions League. Does that change your thinking at all? Or you still think the style of football is really going to challenge Reese in the way that he probably is not going to appreciate or maybe the way his you know body is at the moment is is not perfectly aligned in terms of health fitness and and maybe some of that conditioning we talked about in the early part about what he's going to bring to the side Pacino is going to bring to the side might actually end up being a net benefit to Reese over the long term of his career no i think it, it doesn't really change my opinion that much i think obviously if you can manage his workload a little bit sure great but um gusto again is somebody who is 19 20 years old he will be gunning for that starting position i think he the pitch to him was you know what you can take over that first team slot if if possible so um you know you need to push you need to do your best and and there is that spot there for the taking so you could rotate james in and out but then again it's just you know what rhythm what consistency and then again just the level of high intensity work that you do in a pochettino side the level of pressing he has to do i mean even even under lampard like before he got injured you could see he was pressing as high as the attacking third from right back and and that's when i was cringing i was saying this guy is just pushing himself to the limit he's not realizing it but you know it's going to crank something up in his body and and it it unfortunately happened i think he was playing through it I think that's the reason why his his Potter's coaching setup said, you know what, just minimize as much as you can and make sure that he doesn't like get out before we play a Champions League quarterfinal. But unfortunately, that happened, and um, here we are. But if he can be managed, great. But then some injuries are, you know, unfortunately chronic. We've seen that with Ruben Loftus Cheek to a point. We've seen that with Pulisic, repeated injuries. We're seeing that with Kovacic also. Uh, but yeah, it's just trying to figure out like what the root cause is, and and I, I genuinely fear for Reese because he's getting injured an incredible amount. I don't know how many games he's missed in the past couple of seasons, but it is a significant chunk. And if this keeps on happening, especially with the with the demands that will be made off him, even if he's rotated in and out of play, I think it still could end up costing him. But again, me being the optimist, saying. It won't happen, but I'm looking at it from a very pragmatic lens. So, yeah. Well, if you think about it this way, from a Premier League perspective in terms of minutes played, Reese James, now shut down for the season, will have appeared in, started 14 games, made 16 appearances. That will be the lowest number since the 2019-2020 season. He'll have played 1,244. Premier League minutes. That is the lowest since 2019, 2020, where he played 1,515. And when you expand that to all competitions, so we're taking in any type of cup matches, his total matches played this season will be 24 with 22 starts, 1,935 minutes played. That is the lowest again since 2019, 2020 where he played in 37 matches, 26 starts, and 2,393 minutes. So definitely he's off also, his peak. He's also played 35 minutes less than Jorginho, who left in January. So 
Wow, um, you just hit us with a deep cut of a stat there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's not very encouraging to be honest. Um, but yeah, it's 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 coming to a point where I think Gusto was a very, very good move because you know you don't want just a rotating option, you want somebody who can challenge for that right back spot going forward. And and especially at his age, with his ability to play in a back three, in a in a back four. That was good planning on on behalf of the hierarchy, but uh, yeah, we have to be very very careful. I don't know what the the process will be. I hope there will be some the same level of diligence that was done with San Golo Kante. Hopefully, we do with Rhys James, and then we don't have to worry about you know rationing his minutes at all. But uh, yeah, I think we need to be very careful. Well, all right. So I've I've put it off long enough because I think mine will also draw some some raised eyebrows uh, like the uh, like the rock in uh, WWF era i think tiago silva could also be an individual who loses out some under Mauricio pochettino's mm-hmm. side for some of the same reasons that you talked about in terms of the physical demands and this isn't to say that tiago silva isn't in a physical condition as a individual who is the same age as him wouldn't aspire to be at a moment's notice but more relative to the fact that he has been more likely to be injured this season than past seasons. There is a likelihood, or at least a thought potentially, where Marisa Pochettino would be more likely to play a back four and where Thiago Silva has excelled for Chelsea specifically, has really been as the central center back in Chelsea's back three. And when you have the crop of center backs that Chelsea has now in Benoit Badia-Shiel, in Levi Colwell coming back, in Trev Chalaba, with the intensity of the game that Mauricio Pochettino is likely to play, as much as we value the leadership, again, this is just a thought exercise, but I could see Thiago Silva potentially being someone who would start frequently But it would be very well known that this is the transitional year where he is then making way for this group of individuals who really are the next generation of of Chelsea center back. Not to say that he isn't capable of doing a job. Again, he's a professional footballer at the same age I am, and I am absolutely not. So this is more of just trying to look at all aspects of the situation. I think you've you've hit the nail on the head in terms of if we do go with the 4-2-3-1, it exposes Silva to every single weakness he has in his game. You would ask him to defend wide a lot because the fullbacks bomb forward, you know, the midfielders participate in the counter press. So you would often want or you would often demand that he goes out to address wide threats because that's where the counters come from. And Silva is not really somebody who's comfortable defending out wide. He gets very very iffy shaky uh, when he's up against quicker players and then you can see that most of his you know senior moments have come when he's been defending out wide but uh that plus just the 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 amount of times that pochettino's defense has been left you know against a counter-attack against a transition requiring athletic interventions i think we might just turn his bones to dust unfortunately so we we have to be you know a little appreciative of of everything that he's done for us um and and be like you know what we should subject you to this level of physical you know manipulation at this age but i mean i see a little bit of hope as well because at at psg we did see a 3 4 2 1 mm-hmm. you know and and tottenham i think he has used a 3 4 2 1 as well so he has used the same system that thomas tuchel has um graham potter has so we might just see something come out of left field and and he comes to you know rocks up to the bridge and the first formation he plays is a 3-4-2-1 because we've got Colville, we've got Koulibaly, if we can't move him, we've got Kukurea, we've got Fofana, we've got Chaloba, we've got about six center backs. So if if we can't move most of them, if you don't have four at the start of the season, if you have five or six, then he might go 3-4-2-1, convert James to a wing back which would make more sense to be a little more conservative and then see where it takes us. I think that also is a scenario that we cannot discount it. It can happen in that case, you know, Silva definitely gets a a garden. 
All right. Well, I'm sure people are going to have opinions on that section of uh, players who uh, benefit and maybe lose out with Pochettino's introduction into Chelsea. Again, uh, alleged, not necessarily confirmed at this exact moment of time of recording, but Saul sources are, and the, the Ouija board is saying yes, as we uh, hold hands digitally across it to see what the fate for Chelsea's next manager is. We've got a couple, though, question and answers. I completely, I completely misheard that. I said you th- I thought you said a Ouija board was saying. I was like, why is the Ouija board saying that? Well, the Ouija board saying like, y- yes, Mauricio <laughs> Pochettino, like next Chelsea manager. <laughs> Are the ghosts telling us Mauricio Pochettino is the next coach? Oh yeah, the, go- the ghost of Chelsea managers past. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we got a couple of listener questions that we're going to rock through here before we send you on your way from this bit of a mega episode, as it were, on Pochettino. We're going to start with Dieter's question, just asking, can Chelsea aim for top four again under Pochettino and what formation will he use? I think those two tend to be major questions. We've gone over them a little bit, Sam. I'm going to say that it's a non-negotiable for Chelsea to be aiming for a return to Champions League within a one season period. I think that is going to be an expectation I also think it is going Mm -hmm. to be a massive challenge to close the gap year over year, particularly when every one of those sides that is currently above us on the table will feel buoyed by their performances this year. And some of them have a lot more money than they previously had to be able to reinforce and don't need as much work necessarily as Chelsea. So it is a tall order, but I do think that will be an expectation. And there definitely are a lot of pieces that Pochettino will have to be able to try to ascend at the same rate year over year from an improvement perspective. Yeah, like you said, I think there are certain standards that are absolutely set in stone and you cannot talk about compromise or transitions anymore. I think he's got a very good young squad. He's got a lot of great clay to mold into the kind of setup that he wants to use. I think he should definitely get us top four. And if he gets us there, like, in or about with a style of play, like if, for example, on the table of justice, we've actually, you know, missed a lot of chances, but we've jumped up on XG somewhere close to 60, 65, I would still be very, very happy. And I would say, okay, what, you know what, give him another season because the jump he's made from this season to the next, uh, huge. But I want to see, you know, a discernible philosophy. I want to see the kind of changes that raise the bar of, of this team in, in terms of its individual elements as well as its collective unit. I think that's the expectation I would have. But we definitely, I think Pochettino most of all would go into the season saying top four is 100% the aim and you should not aim lower. All right, well, there's that. And then formation thoughts? Do you have any general thought? Again, I, I know we've heard that like, you know, formations aren't necessarily as important as maybe some of the application and performance. Uh, I believe that was, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of his viewpoint, but any thoughts about maybe just, you know, some, some numbers that might make people feel like they uh, have better understanding about what it might look like on the field. No, I think four, two, three, one makes the most amount of sense to me in terms of something he's familiar with, something that suits the personnel. Um, Like I said, I think small chance that he goes with the three, four, two, one, the other stuff that he's used, I think he's used a 4-4-2 at Spurs as well, as well as PSG sometimes. So those two formations can also happen, but I would say 4-2-3-1 is most probable. And then after that, the 3-4-2-1. I think those two, definitely. All right, next question from Dallas Deep asking, what will Poch offer that Jose can't? <laughs> Mr. Levy, don't speak pay and don't speak <laughs> yeah, I'm not even going to try that. because my accents are always <laughs> terrible. So yours, uh, yours won the episode. But you my, know, my accents are very good. I think that's that's something that people are not familiar with. I'm actually a pretty good mimic. You know, I do King Julian from Madagascar really well. I will do it on the podcast someday. But <laughs> um, yeah, I think. <laughs> but I think it's just uh, in terms of a direct comparison. I think I don't think it's fair to either one of them. Um, but it's, I, I do see shades of Pochettino, sorry, shades of Mourinho in Pochettino. He wants to be 
you know, um, very proficient in all four phases of the game. He wants to be compact. He wants to be very well organized in a possessional sense. You know, he he wants to be, have sort of like a unit that fights for each other. It's just the basic principles of it. He talks a lot about team dynamics, about having high level athletes who are mentally resilient. I think those things are, again, something that I see in both those managers. And in terms of being ruthless, um, I think Pochettino is a little more refined in the way that he deals with people. So I think uh, Mourinho can be brash publicly, which I would say that has sort of led to his downfall in the last few years that we've seen. He's publicly been, you know, gone berserk a little bit. But Poch is is a little bit more contained. He voices his concerns in private and he voices them um, in a very dignified manner. He doesn't really come to the point where he makes you cry. So I think Jose can do that very easily, but uh, Poch cannot and, and does not. Well, that is a, a good thought there. There was a question from Unagi asking, could you please mention how Poch teams dealt with top teams with high possession football? So I think this might even be the uh, like a Mauricio Sari side going up against Tottenham. Uh, <laughs> just the the goal of maybe I would imagine a 65, 70% high possession. It, it feels like his team has been comfortable playing on the counter and being okay not having possession, mm-hmm. though some of his sides yeah. have, you know, also been gifted possession like PSG. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's sort of his identity that has translated upwards. I think when when a lot of good sides have come to him in the Champions League, he's actually managed to put in some good performances because when you look at Mbappe and you give him space, um, to run into you obviously it's a terrifying combination you see the kind of moves that Pep is putting off with Haaland you wouldn't see it with the likes of Mares or or you know of Sterling obviously somebody who did very well at his peak when he had that level of speed but Haaland is consistently running through on goal from like deeper positions he has a lot of space to run into it did it did work pretty well in those in those competitions but when it came to using the ball, getting the ball back from the opponent, I think at times they have struggled, especially at PSG. It's when they have to control the game, when they have to see out the game with possession. Um, Like we say, like the the amount of control we saw on the Thomas Tuchel, for example, just keeping the ball, making sure that, you know, like, like Pep says, they can't hurt you if they don't have the ball. So I think that's something that I haven't really seen from, from Tottenham or PSG. And that's something that, that, um, makes me a little afraid, which is why I was leaning more towards Luis Enrique because he would he would definitely be the, you know, the archetype of that level of control. I, a control bordering on the excessive, but uh, somebody who would definitely allow your team to do that. You know, take a one-goal lead and then keep the ball to a point where the opponent makes a mistake. And I think that's something that Pochettino lacks. All right, second and last question here would just be from Eat Sleep Chelsea asking about the tactical approach in big games, not wanting to see us assume an underdog or counterattacking mentality. So you just touch on this a little bit. What do we think he'll do? Mm -hmm. I also think that maybe we're the players in the current side are not as similar to, they are dissimilar rather to the Chelsea players that existed in some of the teams that people view as their, their touch point moments with, Drogba, Czech, Terry, Lampard, and point to those and say, like, well, why are we not viewing it like that? Why aren't we walking in with our chest puffed out mm-hmm. and believing that we are the biggest team in the world? Like that has to be built up and the bricks have to be Absolutely. laid to create an understanding of like, this is who this team is. I would say that, that we really haven't shown <laughs> that, that that's who we are this season. And so I think it's going to be something where you would hope that there's actually not one approach to any type of game against the big side and that we are adaptive in the way that we handle it, whether it is counting or, you know, countering because it's the best way to manage a team or handle a team or to get the result you're looking for. And at the same time, building off of those results to showcase the confidence in the players from individually, their ability to execute in those games, but also as a team to be able to execute in those moments. So I think it's a, it's more about the work 
to get there so that you don't have to view yourself as an underdog because I would imagine right mm-hmm. now that there's just a general assumption that we are the underdog in any of these games that we go into, particularly against sides that maybe in the past have, we have not viewed them as someone on the same level as Chelsea. And I think maybe it's just too much view of the historical Chelsea, not necessarily of, of the reality today. And there's also been a, a very interesting tactical shift in the World Cup, hasn't there? I mean, when you look at Argentina and their historic roots, it's always been La Nuestra, which in Spanish means our way of playing. And there was this whole debate going on saying that with this rise of everybody wanting to play a very positional Pep Guardiola style of football, half South American you know, nations lost their identity. It's, you know, has Argentina lost its identity of having these athletes who love to play, who love to uh, combine with each other, have fun while playing it, have these organic connections which are lost in, in trying to be, you know, chess pieces on a board and and against a very technically good France side which came to dominate, which had, you know, the World Cup credentials to go with it. They, they absolutely played their own way. I would say it was Argentina rediscovering their identity in the fact that you can go to a game against I would say technically superior opponents and and play your own way and still win, you know. And, and I think if you have an Argentinian manager who insists on that, saying that we will win it our way, why not? You know, it's we've always thrived when we've been the underdog. You know, we've always gone into into high level ties, being told we can't beat Barcelona in two thousand and twelve. We can't beat Bayern Munich. We can't beat Manchester City. So why shirk from that identity? You know, embrace it and play the way that benefits us. Give nothing to lose. And if a manager tells you that, go and embrace it and see where it takes you. The last one that people have asked about, and I'm not going to call it anyone in specifics, but we did get a lot of questions about, do you think Pochettino tries to convince us to go after Harry Kane? Would you go after Harry Kane? Is no. he the right solution? I think your no makes it pretty obvious. <laughs> no. I mean, like, look, no. the, the reality of the situation is he's scored more goals independently, uh, you know, over the past, uh, you know, a, a, you know, one to two seasons and Chelsea will, um, you know, score themselves as a to- total team across all competitions this year. Like that, that, I think that we, is, we will be Dan, I think Dan, we will be the first club in history to have a hundred million striker at Inter Milan and a hundred million striker at AC Milan within the next two years. If that <laughs> happens genuinely, it's just going to be, you know, that level. I, I do not see the point in listening to Daniel Levy and saying a hundred million for a 30 year old forward who's had ankle issues, major ankle injuries, who's going to basically decline in the next couple of years, maybe like three years or so. You can bet on a Lewandowski, but how many 34-year-old forwards do you see, you know, killing it in the Premier League, like recently? It's it's not that easy, especially with his injury record. So I would say it's a major, major red flag. You know, Pochettino might ask for it, but unless the price is right, unless the logistics make sense, I think we're again going into the, into the same route of, you know, going for the shiniest, most amazing toy available. We've got a great recruitment set up. Look at the options that are available. There are some really good forwards out there who will cost half. Won't be as good, but maybe two years, three years down the line, we'll be able to offer a certain level of goal output that isn't as bad as what we've produced. So I would say save that money and I don't don't spend it away, especially when there are other key positions that we need to reinforce in. Look, the, the only reason we should do it is if we had 1,000% certainty that bringing Harry Kane in with Mauricio Pochettino, that Chelsea would the very next season win the Premier League, because that would be worth a lot of money <laughs> to see the reaction and the meltdown from Tottenham supporters. <laughs> that, 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 is, that, is, that is the only way you can convince me that it would be worth the dollars and cents. And I, now you've got me thinking, yeah, <laughs> the vengeful, the vengeful side of me sitting there thinking, hmm, screw tactics. I think that's a really good, you know, option to, to just to see Daniel Levy sitting, clenching his jaws really hard. You know, I think that would be a sight worth seeing 100%.
Well, we, we will not give in to the dark side of the force. We will not engage our inner Sith Lords, and we will uh, lean more to the light side in the way of the walk the way of the tactics Jedi's and try to advise the club when, whenever they might be willing to listen on maybe other players that would be of a better return on investment in here for a long, long period of time. But we want to thank you, Sam. I'm saying the collective we as of everybody who is listening to this and has stuck around for a bit of a double-sized episode. This is the Oreo double stuff of Mauricio Pochettino podcast, and we've hooked you up. So thank you for listening, and thank you, Sam, for all the hard work to get us here and to prepare, and hopefully Chelsea get the deal done so this episode, as people reference, doesn't go to waste. (laughs) <laughs> fingers crossed i'm keeping my i mean the way my luck is going i wouldn't be surprised if like a hundred feet meteor you know just ends up right outside his doorstep and stops him from getting outside the house or something i think that's the way it's just been going for me so i wouldn't be surprised but i'm just hoping that everything goes to plan and uh we just get down to business i think we have a lot of work to do a lot of groundwork to lay before we start next season so i think it's good to get business done early and hopefully a lot more conversations to to be had with you come summer. Well, I'm sure that Chelsea will not leave us wanting for topics over the weeks and months ahead between the end of this season, because really we're kind of in a extended preseason right now and the beginning of the next Premier League season. But that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your support, sharing these episodes and letting your friends know about the podcast. We always appreciate it. Leave a five-star review if you want to and that would make us feel very very nice and warm our hearts and look you can join us on patreon too and our wonderful discord community sam answers questions in there too from time to time and uh he seems to enjoy it and so the people do as well but that's gonna wrap us up we've got so many more podcasts coming before you got a brentford match review and look if there's uh pochettino news we'll get an emergency pod out as well this week so Stay tuned for all of that. But until next time, Chelsea supporters, stay safe and stay well. And until next time, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.